Good morning. Isn't the sunshine nice? Uh, welcome on this beautiful day. This is Transfiguration Sunday. And we are glad that you are all here with us today. Um, um, I had some slides for you to show. Did you show those? <laughs> Sorry. I forgot what order they were in. Ash Wednesday. We are planning on having a service on Ash Wednesday at 6 p.m. We hope that you can make it. We hope that the weather cooperates so that we can all make it. Um, and then we will have console following the service. Then, um, we will be seeking dairy um, Lent, the Honest Questions for Deeper Faith. That will be our theme. And there will be a Bible study beginning March 5th, um, following worship that um, Deb is putting together for us. So we hope you will join us throughout Lent. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, you're right, it does. It starts at 10. <laughs> Sorry. I, I just keep having this 1030 in my mind. We don't want it any later. <laughs> so, yeah, yes, I'll change that. Thank you for catching me. Um, do we have any other announcements to share? Sammy? What's your name? Charlotte. Oh, I like that name. <laughs> Charlotte. Okay. She's in California. Is that right? <laughs> I bet. Oh, wonderful. Congratulations. Meals on Wheels in March. And we're just doing Mondays? Is that just deliver on Mondays, so um, <coughs> let George know if he can help out. There's only five Mondays. <laughs> but Four or five Mondays, so I think we can, we ought to be able to handle that. Yeah. All right. Let us come together then and uh, join in worship. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. On glory's mountaintops of wonder and delight we wait. In the valleys of everyday lives where noise overwhelms us we wait. In the devouring fires of fear, in the midst of misguided living, we wait. When you could stay hidden behind your glory, you send Jesus to show us your heart. When you could remain silent for all time, you whisper your hopes. You whisper your hopes to us in every moment. When you could remain on the pinnacle of our praises, you enter the depths of our shadowed lives. When we bump along over the potholes of impatience, you smooth out our lives with your wisdom. When we live in the hollows of hopelessness, you would transfigure us with your joy. When we wander the lone valleys of grief and death, 
You are beside us, holding our hearts. You transform everyday events into miracles of awe. You text messages of joy into the emptiness of our souls. You into the fog of our feeble, fear-filled faith to reveal to us the mountain star of hope. God and community, holy and one, you are the glory of our mountaintops and the comfort of our valleys. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us join in singing, we have come to at Christ's own bidding. Please be seated. Sometimes, sometimes it seems that we wait for God to astound us and astound us with um, God's mighty works and wonders. And we wait while even, even though God knows that um, we, what we need is, is grace not really the wonders. God, in turn, waits to forgive us. And so we are to hold nothing back. We are to trust in the one who listens to our prayers and shows us mercy. Let us confess our brokenness before God. God of mountaintops, the din of the world can harden our hearts to your word. We watch news, reality TV, sitcoms. We have trouble bearing witness to your presence in our lives. Our face is placed in those who fail us. Our trust is given to those who misplace it. Forgive us, revealer of mystery. You offer mercy to us 
that we might call, hear your call to discipleship. You worship our names that we might know you have loved us. Caught by the surprise of your never-ending love for us, how can we not follow our Lord and Savior into the mountaintops of worship and into the valley of sacrifice and service? On the mountaintops and in the valleys, in our homes and in our hearts, God knows us better than we know ourselves. And God forgives us when we cannot forgive ourselves. And I obviously changed prayers on you, didn't I? Sorry. <laughs> Go to the sun response, please. First scripture reading is from Exodus chapter 24, verses 12 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I'll give you the stone tablets with the instructions and the commandments that I've written in order to teach them. So Moses and his assistant Joshua got up, and Moses went up God's mountain. Moses said to the elders, Wait for us here until we come back to you. Aaron and Hur will be here with you. Whoever has a legal dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The Lord's glorious presence settled up on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it for six days. On the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from the cloud. To the Israelites, the Lord's glorious presence looked like a blazing fire on top of the mountain. Moses entered the cloud and went up the mountain. Moses stayed on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. Listen to the Gospel of Jesus according to Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and brought them to the top of a very high mountain. He was transformed in front of them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with Jesus. Peter reacted to all of this by saying to Jesus, Lord, it's good that we're here. If you want, I'll make three shrines, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, look, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I dearly love. I am very pleased with him. Listen to him. <coughs> Hearing this, the disciples saw on their faces filled with awe. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said, don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anybody about the vision until the human one is raised from the dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
echoing Moses' experience on Mount Sinai, Jesus went up the mountain and was transfigured before Peter and James and John. In other words, his appearance changed. Jesus' face began to shine and like the sun, and his clothes became radiant. The disciples were in awe. Although Peter now became busy talking about building dwellings for Moses and Elijah, who had appeared alongside the transformed Jesus. And as usual, totally missed the whole point of the day, that God's proclamation of Jesus was now that God was the father of Jesus, and Jesus was God's beloved son. We don't know what happened on the mountain, really, that day, or why Peter said what he said. We've lost a lot to history and cultural understandings that uh, we no longer hold. However, then is now, transfiguration, the act of being transformed, was a big deal, is a big deal. Except now, a transformation has also become a big business. Whereas in the ancient world, mountaintops were places where it was understood that heaven and earth met and the veil between life and eternal life was thin. Our modern day interpretation of those mountaintop experiences are different. Because we spend a lot of time and money to go into those places, to get the new look, a new face, uh, um, new clothes, a new body. We still do not understand that no matter how much we spend at the gym, how much time we spend at the gym, or how much money we pay someone, the all we receive for our transfigurations will never equal the awe the disciples felt that day on the mountaintop. In our transfiguration, we never allow our authentic selves to shine through. Often those around us don't understand our needs or our transformation. Now, the disciples didn't understand that day either. They mumbled and they grumbled all the way up the mountain. Why is Jesus so intent on climbing a mountain? We could have stayed in bed longer. They were only aware of the surface Jesus. All too afraid to go deep, to go far enough to discover, gee, this is bugging me. Far enough to discover what more there was to the man they followed around. Do you guys recall when Susan Boyle? got up on the stage at uh, Britain Got Talent all those years ago. And how the judges reacted to that. They had already declared her, by her looks, unworthy of being there. And then she announced the song she was going to sing. And the snickers grew louder. And you could see the judges, especially Simon Cowell, hold their hands close to the buzzer, prepared to strike her down. 
Then the music began. And as she began to sing, those clouds of judgment parted. And Susan Boyle was transformed into what God intended for her to be, a gifted singer. And she transformed the audience and the judges as well. That's kind of what occurred on the mountain as James and John and Peter gazed upon, upon Jesus. Suddenly the clouds parted and the disciples, at least on a slightly deeper level, saw Jesus for who Jesus was. And if you recall, it was only three years earlier at his baptism that when Jesus was coming out of the River Jordan, the heavens opened up and Jesus heard God say, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And now these three years later, the heavens again open up and the voice of God says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. However, this time, others heard it too. And then God added three essential words. Listen to him. No longer is this only about the transformation of Jesus as God declares God's joy of Jesus as God's son. With those three simple words, listen to him, God draws us into that transformation. The word transfiguration means to change the appearance of. The term is a root found in the Greek word metamorphosis indicating not just an outward change, but also an inward change. As Susan Boyle ended her song that day on Britain's Got Talent, her world and our world changed. So too, up on that mountain, Jesus had changed. Perhaps, perhaps it was his knowledge of the future beyond the cross or the disciples as they underwent the metamorphosis. But that act of transforming left them in awe. That act of transformation leaves us in awe and often frightens us. You know, you only need to mention the word change in a church and you can see fear rise up. Like the disciples that day, the thought of change and transformation can cause us to dig in or kick and scream all the way into that new transformation. I'm sure some of the longtime members of this congregation can relate to that. However, it's sometimes difficult to see changes occur when you aren't sure they are for the better. That unknown. When I was serving the church in Truro, each Sunday I would enter the sanctuary and um, try as I might, rather than looking up at the altar area, my eyes would be drawn to this little corner off to the side where the organ sat and the keyboard and mics and chairs. And I think a pile or two of hymnals. And they were all kind of lumped together down there. The rest of the sanctuary was lost to me. 
A worship service is made up of many parts. The prayers, the litanies, the scripture readings, the message, and also the music. In Truro, the music area looked like an afterthought, as if it wasn't part of the worship experience. And then one day following a service, a funeral service, a group of us were sitting in the um, pews chatting away. And as we talked, my eyes went to the music area, music corner, and then to the chancel, back to the music corner, you know, kind of like that. Um, and I just kind of couldn't stop that back and forth motion. And I thought, okay, this place needs the transformation. And looking at the keyboard as I, I said, hmm, what, what is all that stuff over there in that corner? What was its purpose? What, what was it there for? Was, does, it, does it all work? When was the last time it was used? Tucked away in the corner with her back, not only to the congregation, but to me, it was easy to miss cues. She would have to strain around things to see when it was time for hymns. So I suggested that we move the keyboard and the keyboardist to the chancel area up here, facing the congregation. And of course, you know how that goes, one thing kind of led to another. But by the time we were finished, the sanctuary had a more open feeling. And the worship flowed together. Even the eternal light, which had been placed over that corner, could now be plugged in and actually shine out. And the multitude of plants that was scattered amongst the sanctuary was placed so that it added warmth to the environment. A change, a transformation. Some of you remember when uh, the Iowa Conference had the Iowa Youth Council because I think a number of kids from this congregation were a part of that. One Sunday they met at the Fairview Church south of Corning and our daughter Katie was on the council at that time and asked if they could rearrange the pews. The pews weren't secure to the floor so they were able to do that and <clears throat> we said yeah if you put them back where they were right right so that saturday night the youth council slept in the sanctuary tiny little sanctuary in their sleeping bags and the next morning we walked into a sanctuary that no longer had pews in rows like this rather they were all kind of in a semicircle and moved closer to the front. Bob and I was sure that the congregation there would just not <clears throat> like that at all. But as they walked into the sanctuary looking for their spot, they all realized they had to move and find a new spot. And after the service, a number of them said, you know, this is kind of neat. We like this. Can we leave it this way? And we did. When the church closed, 
the pews were still in those semicircles and close to the front. Now think about it. Rearranging furniture in a sanctuary can make a difference. And if rearranging that furniture can make a difference, what would a transformation in our own lives do? The disciples who went up on the mountain with Jesus and down again had to do, to do it in a dramatic way. But each of us is called in our daily lives to also be drawn to those places where we see and know Christ with greater clarity. The mountains, maybe, or maybe it's just in prayer. And then when we leave there, we return to the daily rhythm of our lives. But we have absorbed what we have seen and we have allowed it to infuse how we perceive and enter into our ordinary everyday lives. There was a practice um, in the pilgrimage that um, the conference used to have, and um, Bob and I went through it, and I know Deb went through it, um, where we learned to pray in the midst of the ordinary. In the midst of the ordinary of just looking out the window as we're doing dishes and finding God. And knowing how our lives could change in that moment. So simple and so filled with awe. On this Transfiguration Sunday, we move from the season of Epiphany into the season of Lent. And on Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, Jesus calls us to begin the journey to the cross with him. A journey that may require a change, a transfiguration within us. Throughout the time of Lent, let us listen to where Christ is calling us so that we might see him with more clarity. Let us look inward for we change how, how we move through our daily lives. Let us open ourselves to how Christ might yet open a sense of awe within us. And as we draw near to the empty tomb from which our Savior emerged, may our lives be transfigured into lives where Jesus shines through us in all we say and all we do each and every day. Amen. Please join me in our affirmation of faith. We believe in the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of the saints called from the entire human family. We believe that Christ's work for reconciliation is made manifest in the church as a community of believers who have been reconciled with God and with one another. That unity is therefore both a gift and an obligation for the church. Jesus Christ, that through the working of God's Spirit, it is a binding force. It's simultaneously a reality which must be earnestly pursued and sought, one which the people of God must continually be built up to retain, that this unity must become visible so that the world may become a separation of enmity and hatred between people and groups is sin 
which Christ has already conquered. And according that anything which threatens this unity may have no place in the church and must be resisted. That this unity of the people of God must be manifested and be active in a variety of ways in that we love one another, that we experience, that we ex practice and pursue community with one another, that we are obligated to give ourselves willingly and joyfully to be of the benefit and blessing to one another, that we share one faith and have one calling and are of one soul and one mind. Let's join together in singing our hymn, Take Us to the Mountain. Please be seated. Let us come together in prayer. Holy God, in the silence of this sacred space, we join our hearts in prayer knowing that you hear us and that you want to hear from us. We lean into your strength and your understanding. In you, we find our purpose. In you, we find hope and healing. Our joys spill over, Lord, when we remember to be grateful and to count our blessings as individuals and as a community. We praise you, O oh God, and thank you. We thank you for the gift of life, for each new day, for the chance to come together as a community, for occasions to draw near to family and friends, for meaningful work and opportunities to serve. 
We thank you for our church and for all it means to us. We share in the joys of those who celebrate this day, in the joy of Charlotte's birth, in the joy of those who heal and are able to resume normal activities. We thank you, Lord, for the children and young people that come into this church and into our lives, who remind us how life is filled with possibilities and hope, no matter our age. We lift our prayers of concern for those who need your hope and for those who do not know that others are praying for their healing and wholeness. We ask that on this day you especially be with Nadine's brother, Steve, and that you meet each person at their point of need, attend to them, encourage them, and show us, each of us, how we might offer encouragement and love. Our world cries out for you in ways that sometimes seem overwhelming. And so we lift our prayers for the world, especially for the people of Turkey and Syria, for the communities who have suffered from war, from violence, Help us to keep awake, O oh God, to stay alert to the, the opportunities to make a difference in the name of Jesus, to meet you in unexpected places and to find or to bring hope where it's least expected. We choose to serve you, God. Help us to set aside anything that gets in the way of serving you with a clear mind and an open heart. Holy God, in the silence of the sacred space, we join our hearts in prayer, knowing that you hear us and that you want to hear from us. We lean into your strength and your understanding. In, your, in you we find our purpose. In you we find hope and healing. In you we find transformation. This we pray in the name of your Son, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, forgive us, and lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. In the name, or in the same way, I should say, in the same way that Miriam and Aaron and Moses and Samuel called on God's name in their need, so also do God's beloved ones call on God today. May the offerings that we receive today serve as an example of God's loving response. We can give in many ways, through mail, in person, or electronic transfer of funds. Let us give so that others can know and learn of the glory of God. Please join me in our doxology. <laughs>
love and glory. Receive these gifts as symbols of our trust in you. Bless the giver and those who desire to give. Multiply these offerings and the blessings they represent. Guide the disbursement of them according to your will. Please thank you. Let's join together in singing our parting hymn, Christ whose glory gives. <coughs> Forget Ash Wednesday. Listen um, and watch your emails. Uh, listen to the radio and all that for any announcements because that's when it's supposed to get icy up there. So um, listen for changes. But we plan to meet on Wednesday evening. And now may God bless you. May God lead you. May Christ walk with you each and every day. And may the Holy Spirit dance into your heart, transfigure you. Go in peace to love and serve.